Uh, I'm a game and narrative designer, uh, and I've been working telling stories and making games for about 15 years now. Uh, most recently, I've been working in Fragments of Him or for PC and Xbox One, and we're coming out to PlayStation 4 later in the year. Uh, I've worked at places like MTV2 uh, as a freelancer. I've worked for Electronic Arts. Uh, Rebellion uh, is another place I worked as a writer and a games designer. Uh, and of course, like I say, Fragments of Him is now out. Everything's going to be a little bit distorted because uh, I did this 16 to 9 and this is 4 by 3. But, uh, never mind. Um, I'm English and I would like to apologize. Um, I, I am so, so sorry. <laughs> 52% of my country turn out to be um, wrong. Let's just put it like that. <laughs> Moving on. Uh, because I'm English, I also talk quite fast, and there's a lot to say today, so uh, I'm going to keep on going. But what I'm going to do is all the main points are going to be on the slide behind me. So if you're having trouble with the echo or you can't hear me properly, just have a check on there. It's all going to be up there, and it'll help you keep going. So I'm going to talk to you about narrative design. Uh, for me, narrative design is, it, it, the role of narrative design is much more than writing dialogue. And I think when, when we're hired by people, often this is what they hire us to do, come in and fill in some scripts. So I want to talk to you about much more than that. And if there's only one lesson that you get from today's talk, it's very much keep your narrative world consistent. That's, that's the main thing. Um, if you care about storytelling, then work to make your gameplay align with the story to create a really compelling experience. And if you can get those two things aligned, then you're going to have a good story in there. Uh, I can talk to you about plot structure and narrative storytelling and all those kind of things. There's some story uh, videos of that online on Vimeo. Check them out if you're interested. Um, but today, we're going to be talking about the tools that we don't have. So this, I think this kind of experience happens when the player actions feel meaningful and the character fits into the world that they're playing in. So getting this alignment between character actions and the world is where good storytelling comes to life. I'm going to be building a summary sheet today. So at the end, after I've said thank you to you all, I'll have a picture of that summary sheet up. So if you want to take a photo and have something to remember what I've talked about today, it's going to be on the very, very last slide. So you don't need to keep on taking photos of the diagram as we build it. We're going to keep on going there. So I'm going to be building it up. This is going to be the basics of it. Uh, we're going to have five main sections. Uh, and we're going to have a little bit of warning stuff down the bottom there. So to start off with, we're going to be talking very, very quickly about dialogue and performance. Then we're going to be talking about the visuals in the game. We'll be talking about audio in the game. Uh, going to talk a little bit about haptic feedback and, of course, about choice and interaction, which is what a lot of people think of as the main thing of video games, and partly it is. And of course, like I say, at the end, I'll have some stuff for you to avoid. Uh, I'm going to try and keep most of my text on the higher part of the screen so it's easier for you to read if you're at the back. Um, very quickly, let's just go blast through dialogue and performance, because this, this is the verbal bit, the bit that I said I wasn't going to talk about that much. So in some ways, script, writing a script for a game is very similar to writing a script for films. There's lots of books about how to do that well. Uh, in other ways, it's not similar at all. The player can run around, they can open doors, they can jump, they can shoot, they can throw things while the acting's going on. You can really make a mess of this stuff really quickly. So the narrative designer, when you're doing this, you need to decide whether the player can interrupt a line or a scene. Can you shoot the person in the face while they're talking and does the line stop playing? I have seen dead bodies still speaking. It's a little bit strange. Um, Will the narrator or NPCs react to what the player's doing? If you, if you run away half the time, oh, when they're going, oh my god, it's so sad, where are you going? Uh, these are things you need to think about as a narrative designer. Does the player still have interactions uh, all, all the time? And what happens if they try to break the story? So shooting their friend in the head. How can you do this? Does this all work? Is, are their friends all immortal because they have to be in the next cutscene? Uh, all these kind of stuff. There's a lot of things to think about in there. Try to write with, with subtlety, try to get some good actors, because good actors will make or break your, your game. If you have terrible actors, nothing will work in your story at all. So please, please hire good professionals and work with them. But this is all for a different talk in some ways. If you're interested in this and you've got access to the GDC vault, I gave a talk about good writing uh, this year at GDC, so you might want to check that out. Um, but I just want to show you some of the choices that a narrative designer has to make whilst they're writing the script. So, nonverbal tools. Um, let's add that first part on there. That's going to be the first part. We're going to fill in the rest as we go through the day today. So let's move on to visuals. 
So, we, we read worlds intuitively. We see a picture, we see the land, we see the world. That's a very dark picture from Gone Home there. Uh, and we, we intuitively understand what's going on here. We understand the language of a TV. We understand the language of the open pizza box and the, the blanket on the sofa. We, we know that that pattern is probably fairly 1970s. We know this is, a, this is a family that might not have bought the sofa very recently from the wear and tear on it. We can see a lamp, but the lampshade is slightly askew, which makes us think something happened in this place. And all of this happens instantly. Visual is a very, very quick way of telling a story and setting a scene in there for us. So we see these spaces uh, and instantly form images of the lives of the people who live there. We don't need to meet these people. Um, we've already got a good picture of who they are. If you go into their bedrooms, you'd see the kind of people they are. If you go into their kitchen, you see the kind of people they are. So you almost don't need characters if you've done this really well. Characters are just like, oh yeah, that's who I expected to live here, if you do it right. And if these two things line up together, you get a good story. It really helps. So we use this a lot in Fragments of Him. Um, so there's 200 book titles, approximately, in Fragments of Him. All the books fit the characters. All the books are published in the right years for the time of the, that, that particular scene is happening. Uh, all of them match who they are, what they want to do, what they dream about, the, the relationships they've had. The pictures on the walls are pictures taken by the characters when they've gone on holiday or in their working life. The, the style of legs on the chairs. You know, if, you, if you're an artist, and you look, at this, you look at this kind of chair on the left here, you go, nope, straight chairs, less polygons. Make straight leg chairs. But that's not who the people are who live in this place. They would choose something which has got the curves because they like that kind of feel. And so you intuitively, instantly understand something about these people by the way they live there. And everything down to literally the, 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 door, the, the knobs on the drawers in the bedroom have been chosen to reflect these characters. A slightly traditional kind of person, a slightly old-fashioned kind of person who just wants a different form of romantic love. They, they, they believe in romantic love. They don't believe in this kind of, kind of go fast, everything must be consumed now. And their whole living space tells you that maybe they've got that slightly idealistic world, world about them. And that brings you closer to them. So the way that we set up our worlds can lead people to tell stories about them as well. If we look at an example from Bioshock, slightly different world that we're talking about here, uh, you can see that this is a world where this person might be, the, might be a victim, this person might be the killer that a victim is struck back at. But we can see from this world there's something that's happened here before we got there. And likewise, when you look at things like Fallout, this is just a, they do so much environmental storytelling in the Fallout games. This is two skeletons hugging, and if you look on, next to them on the bed, there's a bottle of poison. And there's two people who are in love and couldn't face the world the way it is, and they decided to hold each other as they died. Wow, that's kind of cool for a game that's about robots and mutant orcs and stuff. You know, they, they do a lot of these kind of things. Or to take it into a different wor world, we, we have obviously The Last of Us. And everything in this world tells us about who these people are. Her, her closeness to her family, her closeness to her uncle, the, the kind of films she likes, her, that she's quite sporty and her trophies for playing football and everything about this. We intuitively, instantly understand who this, this character is. And we probably know people like her, or we might love people like her. And that's kind of cool. I like that kind of stuff. We get love into our games. I think it's very important. And this obviously extends to character design, to costume design, um, hair, scars that people have, whether they're able-bodied or not. Um, it, it's, it's, all of these things are decisions which can help you tell stories about your game. And of course, we, we, you have uh, the, the sort of the mechanics should be supporting this, but all of these parts do support this narrative setting here. Now, if you're going to make a game like this, and you kind of go, yeah, that makes complete sense. World War I setting, he's nice and protected, we understand what's going on here, we un th this world makes sense. If he was wearing like a tank top and going to war, they'd kind of go, why have you got your arms? It's, well, that makes no sense. If you're gonna be in this dangerous situation, whoa, yeah. Let's fight zombies with claws and teeth and not wear anything on our arms. That doesn't make any sense. And that doesn't support the narrative setting of the game. So, when you make visual or other design choices that don't fit your world, you're lowering the player engagement. The mechanics might still be fun, but they've lost meaning. Because you need to get this alignment between the two things to get that meaning working. It's, if, if, your, if your whole thing is about fighting zombies and being desperately uh, trying to protect yourself all the time, and you're wearing a little tank top, that doesn't make sense. 
Either you're going, this person's very stupid, or the character design is very stupid. And this woman is not very stupid. Or there's different priorities going on there rather than realism and immersion in the storytelling. So if you care about storytelling, you don't design your characters this way. You design them, they make sense. So try to be consistent with your narrative setting. I mean, if, if, you're, if you're gonna be having something like this, you want your enemies to make sense in it as well. So Dr. Robotnik works in the world of Sonic. He looks right for that world. He's an evil corporation. He's a robot trying to destroy the environment kind of thing. It's all very environmentally friendly. If, if the enemy looked like that, that wouldn't make sense. You've got to try and make sure all these things align with each other. Also, something to point out that I think a lot of people forget about is that your HUD design is important too. It's on screen for pretty much the entire game. So please make sure your HUD makes sense. So this is a game called um, Resistance Fall of Man. You may have played it. It was a fairly early PlayStation 3 title. Uh, and it was a lot of fun. Now, down on the bottom left here, you can see uh, the energy bar. It's got this yellow color on it. So um, we're just going to talk about that energy bar for a second. So in Resistance Fall of Man, yellow is the color of these kind of enemy mutant things. Maybe they're a communist threat. Maybe they're aliens. Maybe they're subterranean. Who knows? Um, and your character starts as a human being. For the first level, you're human. But it still has that mutant yellow colored energy bar. It's only after the first level that you become a hybrid. It's kind of part human, part mutant type thing. So it'd been better if you had a green health bar to start off with, kind of green that we associate with health of human beings, and then you had a yellow one after you've changed into a hybrid. That would reinforce the storytelling through the HUD elements that you brought onto the screen there. So don't just think of your HUD as something that you just plat, blat on the top of it and go, yep, that's fine. Think of your HUD as a way of communicating the story. Because these small choices really add up together, and the narrative designers really need to keep check, check of all of these elements to try and bring them into alignment as much as they possibly can. So, uh, environmental storytelling, character design, HUD design, all give pl uh, players an intuitive way into the world here. So using social, cultural, and historical referencing, you can add context to the gameplay, and you can speed up exposition. In terms of storytelling, exposition is one of these most horrible things, like how do I get people to know what the world is? You just do it right from the very beginning. Make the whole world make sense. And you don't have to have the, yes, we're living in a post-apocalyptic society and this kind of stuff. It's, it's all there in the world to see. I do want to say be aware of this kind of stuff because you have to be consistent, making choices that lower believability, that are inconsistent narrative, lower player engagement. Environmental storytelling is mostly kind of archaeological. It's understanding the past of a location. It's not telling you what's happening now. So you often see environmental storytelling, so there was a murder here, there are people who were in love here, but it doesn't necessarily tell you that they're going to be here now or in the future. So be careful about putting all of your weight into environmental storytelling. Think about other things too. These things can take a lot of work and be easy to miss. Um, it takes artists a lot of time to build really good environmental storytelling. If you've only got a few artists, this is hard work. Uh, or developers sometimes really overcompensate and make it impossible to miss the environmental storytelling. So I'd just like to make a request. Please stop putting huge graffiti on entrances to places, especially if it's written in blood. I've seen that a few times now in games. Oh, we're going into a mental asylum and it says beware in huge letters on blood. I get it. All right, you can be a little bit more subtle than this. And I've seen it so many times now that I'm just like, oh, look, somebody else has been doing that. Or going into a mental asylum and somebody's written over the walls and then they found a stepladder to write in blood on the ceiling again and again, must kill all, must kill all. Yeah, I've seen it. Please be more original with these things. Careful with these stereotypes. And I know you don't want people to miss the thing, but it's okay if they do. Put enough in in other places, and if people care about it, they'll find it. So trust your audience, trust your players. Players are awesome, and they can find a lot of things. So there's a brief summary of what we just said there. Be consistent with social and cultural settings. Uh, think about location, character, props, HUD, everything that goes on screen. Accept that many things will be missed. Just accept that that's going to happen. Uh, and try to avoid cliches. It can be useful in shorthand, but it tends to lead to really bland worlds, worlds that you've seen before. So let's move on to audio. It's very appropriate considering how echoey it is in here. Um, good audio is probably the easiest way to enhance the narrative in your game. It's really so incredibly important. It sets the tone of a sequence. It changes the way the player feels about the situation. Um, so, so I'm going to give you a quite quick example of here of what's, what we can do with this. So you press the button on a lift, and the lift moves into place with a smooth wind to the floor. 
The doors slide open with a near silent swish. Okay. You step inside and there's this reassuring sound of solid metal beneath your feet. It's like, dunk, 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 dunk. Okay. And as the doors close, a pleasant female voice asks you in two languages to select your floor. That's very nice, very polite, very open minded. I like that. So we've got lots of information going on here. What do we know about this now? Well, the building is well maintained. Everything's been oiled, everything's working, and this kind of stuff. There's a regular supply of electricity, which is important, and we know that's probably a good thing. The owners of the building have an international clientele. They expect people from different cultures to be coming there. And the hidden, hidden internal structures of the building do not appear to be a risk to you. We're not expecting the, the lift to suddenly plummet down because nothing's been maintained. We feel safe in this place. This is good. OK, that's great. So let's, let's look at this. I mean, in terms of efficiency, we've got a lot of information coming, coming across here. It's been really efficiently and effectively got, got through with a very simple sound file and a line of dialogue. This was pretty cheap to make. This isn't remodeling the whole wall and the blood saying beware, or, or blood saying welcome. I don't know. Uh, it's very simple. It's much cheaper than lots of script and lots of acting. It's, this is pretty easy stuff. So it's very efficient narrative design. And people are always interested in efficient narrative design because it's cheaper for them. So let's try it a different way. Let's do the same thing, same animation, same lift door, same model. Everything else looks the same. We'll make it sound different. So you press the button and you hear the sound of loose cables slapping against the slide of the shaft, like tick, 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 as it comes up again. Hmm. And the motor somewhere begins to vibrate. And the sound tells you that the lift is approaching. Jig, 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 jig. OK. The doors slide, slide, slowly open. You hear dry metal pulling over rust. You can't see the rust, but there's a kind of creaking as these doors do the same animation they did before. But it sounds very, very different now. And you step inside, and the floor sounds very thin and weak. It's just like a tick, 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 tick. Hmm. And sometimes the metal creaks, and you step inside, and it goes. And there's a sound of sparking electrics going, ksh, 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 ksh. Go, hmm. It looks the same. That's not good. And this pleasant female voice asks you to select your floor in two languages, but then glitches and distorts words into a long animal name. <laughs> Sorry, audio. And that's not good. So what do we now know about this world? Well, it's a kind of a different picture. The, w the building is not well maintained. There appears to be a problem with the electricity going on there. That's never a good sign, really. And the owners of the building have not invested in quality materials. These are people who make it look good on the outside, but there's something rotten inside. That's an interesting thing to know about the people you're meeting there. So these hidden internal structures of the building sound unsafe. And the distorted voice could perhaps sound demonic. Maybe there's something evil going on in this building. It's, it's interesting what you can do just with the sound of a lift door, a little audio file on your, on your feet here. We can do a lot with these kind of things. So audio is a really extremely powerful tool for building narrative setting. And there's a great quote from this. If the stove is off at night, you can hear rats running around in the pipes. This is from Planetscape Torments, and they were talking about their audio design. That tells you so much about the world. And they put all that detail in there. And so they go, and it's just an if statement. If stove is off and it's 10 o'clock at night, then play rats in pipes. Awesome. Takes attention to detail, takes a bit of time, but it's cheap and it really gives you a feeling about that world. So such more details give a great sense of the present condition of the environment around them. We can sense the stories that are going to happen there, and none of this is traditional script writing. As a narrative designer, you're rarely brought in to be a consultant on the audio design of a game. But I think this is a really, really important part for narrative designers to get involved with. So let's put a quick summary of the audio up there. Economically, it's a very good option for storytelling. It feeds directly into the imagination of players. It's excellent for building atmosphere. It can be very subtle. And if you use details like clocks ticking and things like that, it makes the world feel really, really real. It's often forgotten or left until the last thing to do. So please don't make that mistake. Include it in your, doc your documents and plans from the very, very beginning. How will your game sound? Who here has written a game design document or worked with a game des design document recently? Hold your hand up. A few people, not a, not a lot. Did it have a really good audio plan in there? No, no, no. OK. Maybe think about doing that in your future documents. It will help your storytelling a lot. 
So let's look at haptic quickly here. Um, haptic is feedback of things that a person can feel. That's a nice word for it. It's usually vibration in a controller or on the phone. Those are the most common versions of this. But there are more advanced versions. This is the R360 cabinet by Sega. Uh, this will spin you literally upside down and round in every axis. Uh, and this is for a game called Afterburner in the 1990s, I think this was, early 1990s. Uh, yeah, it cost a lot of money. I never got to play on it, but my goodness. That would make you feel very sick. That's properly haptic. That, that you, you'll feel that very vividly. But to be honest, like I say, most of the time this is, um, this is sort of right vibrations in the pad and stuff like that. So let's put it into a different way. You slowly approach the deserted house. You know your brother is doing research there, and he was studying the supernatural. But he's been missing for a week. You walk along rotten planks towards the entrance, and one breaks beneath you, sending a jolt through your body. It's ka -ching -ka -ching. And you feel your pulse quicken as you walk towards the door. It's nice. Gives you a sense of feeling, gives you a, a real feel of who the character is and how they feel about this world. So you're, you're in the lead of a race. And the final corner is coming up and you, you feel the tarmac beneath your wheels and rhythmically beating beneath you. It's like, cha -ching, cha -ching, cha -ching. it's very smooth. You can feel it going there nice. You take the corner but you take it a little bit too wide, and suddenly there's a rattle of grit flying out for the struggle to control the skid, and there's this high-pitched frequency going in your, in your hands. You can feel it shaking. You can feel this distance. Your opponent is closing the gap, and it's made more exciting by the way it feels at that moment. So using rumble in the controller is a really important thing here. We can, we can use it to add this kind of extra visceral dimension to your storytelling or an event in the game. Uh, it's unique to video games. You don't really get this in cinema much. They're trying it a few, a few times now. It's coming through again. But it's not really used in any other medium particularly. So I think this is something that we can take a big advantage of. So like all techni techniques today, it can be, can be distracting if it's done badly. So please use it wisely. Test it with people. But you'll find you can actually use it a lot more than you think you can. And again, have you seen this in your design documents recently? No, probably not. So this, you've only got three things you can do to the player. There's, you can show them things, you can make them hear things, and you can make them feel things. And, well, people usually design the, the, the pictures and forget about everything else. We've got so many tools we can use as, de as developers. Please use them all. So let's add Haptic onto our list here. Um, it's not available on all platforms, but used well, it can be highly engaging. So consider using it for emotional haptic feedback to really bring the player into the world of this. Um, and be careful to enhance, not break the immersion with, it, with the story. So the final, final bit I'm going to talk about is choices. Many stories and games go a little bit like this. So you start off with this kind of very long movie of a few minutes long, and then you kill some stuff. Uh, and then you have a short movie, and then you kill some stuff, and you have a short movie, and you kill some stuff, and that, that kind of repeats for a while, and then you get a longer movie, and then you, the credits roll. That's how most games work. It's pretty good, it works, you know, it's, it's a linear story. Uh, I don't think there is anything wrong with linear storytelling. I think it can be a really powerful thing when done well and telling a good story, so why not? Go for it. Maybe do something other than just killing stuff all the time, but that's a, killing stuff can be fun too, so include that if you want to. It's very popular, and I think it's very popular for a good reason. It really helps us to have a tight control of our plot and the structure and the storytelling experience. So um, feel free to use it if it's right for your game. But of course, we do have other options. So one of them is uh, converging branches. It's also called beaded, uh, where basically you can start off and you can go in one direction, or you can go in another direction, but it's always going to lead you back to the same point again. And maybe there's a few other ways you can do it, but it always leads you back to the same point again. So you kind of get this branching out, coming back in, branching out, coming back in. So things like Dishonored and Deus Ex, they tend to use these kind of structures. They're really cool. It makes the player feel like they're enabled in the world. Uh, it can also break the game a little bit. So in Deus Ex, I did one mission where I sneaked past. Nobody saw me. Nobody, nobody did anything. Nobody was killed. And I got to the cutscene, and it said, wow, did you hear that gunfire? And I was going, nope. I didn't hear any gunfire because I didn't shoot any guns. Uh, but, you know, so be careful with beaded to make sure that those, those central points where it all comes back in make sense for everybody. There's another one called Story Bubbles, also called Modulated or Thingy. Uh, it's also sometimes called Beaded, so this can be a bit confusing. We haven't got any good terms for all these things yet. This is a much more one where you kind of get three missions, which you have to do. You could do them in any order, for example. 
or you have to do all three before you go to the next sort of story point. That story point will always happen. And you tend to have stuff like this in Grand Theft Auto, in Assassin's Creed, where you have to kill all these people before you can do that bit. And you'll always kill all those people. You can do those in any order, but you have to do that before you get there. So that's another way, do, way of doing it. It can be quite cool. It allows you to have kind of a, a bit more free-form story, but it also allows the narrative designer to have control of the plot still. And finally, we have the, the most famous one for games, really, which is branching, where every choice you make leads the player off down a different avenue, and you have these big changes going on. And I think that's the one that people most, mostly think of as, that's how to tell stories in games. We have a lot of options to do stuff. Um, and all of these can kind of feel linear. The first two can definitely feel linear, but they're not always linear. Fragments of Him, for example, is a beaded story with really close, tight, uh, with, with only a little bit of option in there. So in terms of branching, uh, in some senses, this is the purest form of story, uh, interactive storytelling. Actions taken by the player have significant consequences for the outcome of the plot. And every major choice branches into a new direction, leading significant changes later in the story. This is mostly clearly indicated by using multiple endings. Uh, you have, it's completely different endings depending on how you play it. It's really quite expensive to make, usually. Because uh, the player might only see 10% of what you create, depending on how many branches you have in there. And that's really, really expensive, because you still have to spend the money making the other 90%. There's a good reason why real branching isn't done very often. It's just too expensive, especially if you're an indie studio. This is really difficult stuff. If you're going to do this, do it with text or words. You can get away with it. So some nice examples of this, I think, uh, things like uh, Blade Runner from 1997, where literally you'd have a different murderer if you played it a second time. They, it's an investigation plot, a murder plot, but it would be somebody different who did it. That was incredible. Shadow of Memories 2001, I think this is one of the most amazing examples of branching storytelling I've ever played. The interactions are horrible, the movement feels terrible, the puzzles, the first time you play it, you go, there was nothing else to do. And then you play it a second time and go, ooh, maybe there was more to do. And then you play it for the ninth time and you're going, my god, this thing's incredible. But a lot of people didn't play it more than once. And so they missed out on a huge element of what made this game so incredible. If you, if you want to look it up, I really recommend it. Uh, and Heavy Rain, uh, of course, which is probably the most famous version of this, where literally your lead characters can die halfway through. Pretty amazing stuff in terms of design. So in terms of interactivity, make the player actions consistent with the characters in the world that they live in. This is uh, trying to combat something we call ludonarrative dissonance. This is uh, about play and disharmony. This is basically when a friendly, happy explorers, yay, everybody loves Drake, uh, travel the world and brutally kill lots of people. Um, and they kind of go, oh, Elena, I love you. Hang on a second, I'm just going to go kill this guy I've never met. Drake, uh, we need to have a talk, I think. You've got some anger issues here. Uh, don't get me wrong, I love these games. I think they're absolutely brilliant to play. But uh, sometimes you kind of go, hmm, that's a bit weird. But they've been working really hard, especially in sort of second, third, and fourth ones. They've really, really worked hard to try and make this work, uh, make sense. So I don't want to knock them too much. They do a fantastic job. Some of the best stories in games are coming out of this studio. So the characters in action and interactions don't always mix when you have this ludonarrative dissonance problem. So try to get them matching the characters. Um, it's, it's really important. So don't make your heroine an angry and misanthropic and then suddenly have them cheerfully accepting meaningless side quest, fetch quests. It's like, God, I hate the world. This thing is really terrible. You want me to go fetch that thing from over there and kill 20 dragons? Yeah, fine, no problem. She hated everybody a moment ago, and she was an angry and ha badass, and now some random guy in a village has said, hey, we've got a dragon problem, and she's fine doing that. Try to make these things consistent. Please, please try and make these things consistent. Don't have novelty collectible section when the character's supposed to be fleeing a vol volcano. It's like, oh my god, the lava's going to kill us. Oh, shiny. Press X to pick up. Hang on. Blink. OK, the lava. Lava, yes, run. It, it doesn't make sense. Uh, having a strong match between these two things makes the play feel more purposeful. Why are you doing this thing? Why are you in this world? Because first-person shooter mechanics, uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff which is basically pretty similar. The difference between Halo and, and, and Destiny, for example, is fairly small. So it's, it, we, we come down to story, context, the meaning, the surroundings. Why are we doing this? So it makes the gameplay mechanics feel better. And if you're a person who's sitting there going, I don't care about story, I just care about how fun it is, this is part of making it fun for a lot of your players. Not all your players, but for a lot of your players, this is part of it. And hopefully, it's going to make players want to buy the sequel. 
I know, so one of the reasons I kept on buying Assassin's Creed, because I actually wanted to know what happened next. Not because I expected revolutionary gameplay in the next version of it, and sometimes it got worse, and sometimes it got better. It's cool. OK, uh, so let's add that choice and interaction onto the end there. So pick a story structure that works for you, your story, uh, and your team. So linear stories, I think, are still fine. Uh, converging branches, bubbles, uh, or branching, they're all powerful ways of doing this. Choice is powerful, but the workload for your team really escalates very fast as soon as you do this. And I will be putting a, a, a version of this on screen at the very end if you want to take a photo then. Um, try to make your gameplay interactions match your character in the world. That's one of the most important things. So, one thing I want to say about avoiding stuff, uh, like I say, I'll have this on later if you want to get the full picture. Avoid fan service scripts. They often seem lazy to the majority. So if you're making an Aliens vs. Predator game, don't have every Marine going, stay frosty, and go, oh, brilliant, they said that in Aliens. And they said, stay frosty in this as well. That's awesome. Because there's a lot of people going, yep, that's fine. You know, that's, that's OK. I've seen that line before. So try to avoid those kind of stereotypes and cliches. They really drain your world of individuality. Now, so, don't get me wrong, there's an audience out there who loves fan service, but I don't think it's the biggest, uh, biggest audience in the world. Obvious repetition in voice samples, to a lesser extent, is a problem. Uh, you dare steal from me, that will cost you your life. Uh, Assassin's Creed 1, I must have heard that so many times. And it does break the immersion in the world when you hear these things looped too often. It's expensive hiring actors, so I don't blame you if you have to go a bit cheap on this, but try to avoid it if you possibly can. Um, don't overuse haptic. You don't want the pad going <laughs> for three hours. Just think about that one carefully. It's important, but be careful with it. Um, and action choices that don't fit with the character in the world, just avoid that kind of stuff if you possibly can. If a person's going to be a rampaging killer, make that make sense for them. OK. So let's have a quick conclusion. Uh, I'll get back to that slide if you want to see it again sometime. Uh, it's an exciting time for stories in video games. I think it really, really is. And I think we can all agree there's a lot going on here. There's many experiments happening in storytelling. Fragments of him was my kind of addition to this. Even if you are creating a mechanics-focused game, there's no reason to not add a little in extra interest with some of the techniques discussed today. I think these things can fit in pretty easily into about 97% of games. If you're making a pure roguelike kind of game, Maybe it's not going to work for you, but I think everything else can probably benefit from at least a little bit of this. They're about support, supporting immersion. They're based on creating a consistent gameplay environment. And I think this is great for all players. Even if you don't care about the, the, the story, it's good to feel like you're someone in that world. And I think it's a unique and exciting medium for creators, video games. We, but we only need to master the many ways of storytelling beyond only words. Because like I say, as a narrative designer, I, you often get hired to do the script and nothing else. So please think about the other mechanics that a narrative designer can get involved with and help you out with on your team. So I hope today's talk has given you some ideas about how to add extra depth into your worlds. I look forward to seeing what you play. Let me know if you use any of these tips. Um, thank you very much for listening, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> wow. <laughs>